75% of us will end up with parts in our body that we weren't born with. Uh, and that includes you know, millions of joint replacements and bone grafts implanted per year, leading to like a 30, approximately 32 billion bone and joint reconstruction market. Uh, and at EpiBone, we, we, we're striving to help you know, replace like with like. We wanna replace these tissues with similar tissues um, and not necessarily things that are immediately off the shelf uh, that uh, can cause other complications. And so first looking at the, the current treatments and the drawbacks and considerations that are worth looking at. Uh, so the gold standard of bone grafting you know, from uh, an auto graft, where they'll take a piece of bone from another part, part of the body, typically from the iliac crest in the hip, a uh, surgeon will cut out a portion of donor tissue uh, and shape it manually and then plant that into another uh, part of the body. And the difficulty with that is the, the additional pain of having uh, that second surgery to harvest that tissue, as well as the unmatched shape. You know, the surgeon has to create that shape and manually shape it himself uh, before implantation, which can cause some complications, especially for more important uh, features such as uh, facial bone reconstruction. Another standard of care is using an allograft taken from a cadaver. Uh, and while this, you know, can be sufficient for uh, many indications. There is risk of rejection, um, risk of some illness transmission. Uh, and of the, the safe tissue that is out there from cadavers, there is a, a limited supply and it's not available to everybody, especially on a global scale. And the last current treatment I wanna mention uh, is synthetic grafts, um, both metal and plastic, which are commonly used for bone reconstruction. And while these uh, can have good applications, they're non-biologic and therefore don't fully integrate uh, with the native tissue and can potentially lead to long-term failures. So at EpiBone, you know, our mission is to uh, transform patients' lives through personalized skeletal reconstruction, precision design, and stem cell technology. And the most important part of that mission statement really is the first three words of that, the transforming patients' lives. So our kind of our aligning with our mission, our vision for you know, this technology, um, we'll utilize the 3D design to create a perfect fit of grass, as well as the power of stem cells um, and their ability to differentiate from you know, an undifferentiated stem cell into various tissues. Uh, and because these grafts are permanent, we want them to be, be able to grow and live within the patient uh, and you know, not fear any type of rejection or anything like that and have it grow and be a sustainable portion of the patient's anatomy. So we have three products at EpiBone. I'm really gonna be focusing solely on the, the first one, our lead product, um, our EpiBone's namesake, our CMF product, which CMF stands for cranio maxillofacial. Um, so that's representing any bone uh, in the skull, basically anything mandible, the facial bone, as well as cranial bone. Um, so this product is currently in phase one, two clinical trials uh, for safety and you know, some efficacy testing um, before we get forward to the next clinical trial. Um, an overview of our process will utilize 3D design as well as cell expansion um, and combine those two uh, elements of tissue engineering into 3D tissue culture. I'm not going to talk too much about the cell expansion today, but in the next slide, I'll go through some of our cell process and be focusing more on the 3D design and the 3D tissue culture um, that we've processed that we've developed at EpiBone. So here's a, a flow of uh, briefly of our manufacturing process. Um, so again, this is an autologous product, which means that we use a patient's own cells to grow a custom shaped bone graft for each individual patient. So on the left is the uh, starting material that will begin most of the process. So the upper left uh, is the lipo aspirate. Um, so that is our starting material for the cells. Um, we, from the lipo aspirate or the liposuction uh, from a patient's adipose tissue, we'll isolate mesenchymal stem cells from that adipose tissue and expand them in vitro until we have a sufficient number uh, to create a you know, viable bone graft. And these mesenchymal stem cells you know, are found, are fully undifferentiated and then can differentiate into various cell types depending on how we treat them. Uh, in the lab, for example, these mesenchymal stem cells can differentiate into bone, cartilage, or adipose tissue. In parallel to that lipoaspirate and cell expansion, we'll also perform a, a patient's CT scan and generate, a, based with the 3D design, a custom shaped graft for that person. Um, and we'll fabricate a decellularized scaffold. Um, and when we combine the scaffold as well as with the cells, 
um, and mature that in a uh, bioreactor system, which will mimic the environment that is seen in the patient's body, um, we can then uh, yield at the end a mature bone tissue product ready for implantation. So now diving into the beginning portion of the surgical planning. Um, so we work with a virtual, virtual surgical planning company and the surgeon to, together to develop the patient-specific surgery plan. Um, and this, in general, these patients are either trauma, uh, had some kind of trauma and need uh, mandible reconstruction or have uh, congenital defects um, and need, need bone graft source that we can offer them. Um, and the results of this surgical planning will provide us with 3D graph models that will then be a perfect fit um, since they are based on the patient's anatomy. And now for our bioreactor design, um, we'll utilize these graph models to develop custom bioreactors for each individual bone graft. And we'll use a channel array to optimize the flow for each specific anatomical graft. And these channels then facilitate the perfusion of osteogenic media. And this media will help feed the cells uh, and make sure that the cells are happy and growing and differentiating um, from their stem cell nature towards the osteogenic lineage differentiating into bone cells. Um, this media will also provide sufficient flow uh, for nutrients, flushing waste, and also providing shear stress for the cells. And this has been shown to induce osteogenesis. Um, and while we wanna increase the flow to you know, have all of that good nutrients and shear stress delivered, we also wanna have too much flow and then end up shearing the cells off of the scaffold material. So we'll perform iterative flow simulations to evaluate the, the flow profile across various cut planes of the graft to ensure that the optimal flow is delivered throughout the entire graft. And this allows us then to uh, you know, do this for any type of shape, as well as uh, you know, larger shapes. We can control the flow and deliver more flow where there's more bone and more cells that are gonna be needing perfusion. And the colors here just represent uh, the speed and the interstitial space. You can see the, the max minimum speed, uh, the red is the max speed flowing in and out of the bioreactor. And then when it goes through the graft, we can optimize those channels deliver that green uh, optimal flow rate that we were targeting for optimal differentiation and uh, survival of the graft. And as I mentioned, we, I went through just this one shape. Um, we can also perform this for any anatomical shape and we'll just perform this flow simulation uh, and be able to adjust the flow parameters accordingly based on the graft size and shape. Now taking a step back to consider the, the safety concerns, uh, you know, this is a, uh, the bioreactor that we're designing um, and 3D modeling and fabricating uh, is going to be in direct contact with the maturing graft. And we need to consider all the safety concerns, um, beginning with the material sourcing, make sure they're all of the utmost quality and there's control um, so that you know, even if there's a, a change in the manufacturing side of the raw material, that it, how we can either detect it or optimize it in our manufacturing process. And our fabrication process for this 3D design bioreactor includes you know, various methods such as machining, molding, 3D printing, and then following all of these fabrications, we'll also have to perform cleaning qualifications uh, to ensure that we're removing any unwanted particulate, any uncured resin from the 3D print, or any other contaminants that we're trying to avoid. Um, so we've performed you know, product compatibility studies with these materials um, through safety and animal studies. We've also done a thorough ENL validation, ENL being extractables and leachables, to evaluate the chemical species that are introduced during our manufacturing process. Um, and I'd be remiss to mention uh, sterility, you know, all of these components, since they are in contact with biologic material that will then be implanted, we have to make sure that everything is sterile uh, and sterility is maintained both uh, from prior to the process and implementing it into our manufacturing, as well as maintained throughout the entire uh, graph maturation process, which I'll talk about in a couple slides. Along those lines with the mentioning sterility, uh, we'll, all of our uh, open process work is performed in a clean room. Um, so this is our GMP certified clean room for clinical manufacturing. Um, we have this ISO 5 uh, aseptic clean area where we'll perform all of our open processes. Where we'll glove into this modular unit um, and have the user walk around, a technician walk around in the ISO 8 clean room. Where there's a clean barrier and much more simple gowning in our procedure. But again, all of our open processing for any of the cell expansion or graft maturations performed in this clean room to ensure sterility and quality of our product. So now putting all these parts together from the 3D design to the bioreactor that we fabricated, <coughs> um, as well as the scaffold material in the custom anatomical shape, 
that is our starting material where we'll put the uh, undifferentiated stem cells on um, and combine that with the scaffold in the bioreactor system uh, for our full graft maturation uh, process. Um, so this is where the, the bioreactor uh, is filled, it's connected to a media reservoir um, and a pump to facilitate the perfusion of that osteogenic media throughout the bioreactor and that seeded cells onto the scaffold. Um, and that osteogenic media, as I mentioned, will provide nutrients and re uh, you know, remove the waste as it flows to the bioreactor, um, but it also contains uh, various chemicals that will help these stem cells differentiate um, from stem cells along that osteogenic lineage into bone. Um, and we can quantify that differentiation over time by looking at the condition media and quantifying the actual osteogenic protein content that we're seeing in the media. And at the conclusion of graft maturation, um, we start off with that decelerized scaffold. At the end, we're yielding uh, a implantable EVCMF. Uh, and this graft is, you know, demonstrates osteogenic properties. We can quantify the osteogenic protein also within the graft, as well as the DNA content, to sure that the cells are alive and viable. We'll also take samples of that graft uh, and perform live dead staining on it. And you can see in that pore space, um, the green indicates live cells, that there's plenty of live cells in each of those pores. And even looking at the macro scale of the scaffold, you can see the, the pore structure and then the conclusion of graft culture, those cells have really filled in those pores, started to secrete ECM, extracellular matrix, as well as start mineralizing that extracellular matrix. Um, and so I'm not, I don't have, fortunately cannot share any uh, human clinical trial data today, um, but I wanna go through some of our animal studies that we've done and looking at how this product actually performs in vivo. Uh, so again, this is an autologous tissue engineer bone product um, for both head and face reconstruction. And the CT scan here is from a cranial rat study we performed um, for our tox and safety assessment. And you can see that when we compare to the acellular scaffold, so that same scaffold material without any cells, when implanted into the, the rat cranium, um, there wasn't much integration um, with the scaffold alone, but with the tissue engineer bone graft, those red arrows are pointing to uh, bone in growth and showing that the native tissue is growing and integrating with that tissue engineered bone. And then looking further at our engineered bone in a porcine study. Um, so we did a mandible pig study here. We saw that the engineered bone grafts promoted uh, up to 80% regeneration after six months. And that's qualified by BVF for bone volume fraction as measured by the CT scan. Um, and this was significantly higher bone regeneration when compared to both of our control groups. Two control groups were, again, the acellular scaffold, so the scaffold material without any cells uh, added, as well as the condylectomy, which is just a removal of the condyle. Um, and so our engineered bone graft was significantly higher, uh, demonstrated significantly more regeneration of that bone tissue. Um, and then looking at more of the micro scale and uh, the histology pictures on the bottom right, um, we did see that the regenerative bone is integrating with that native tissue. So the host and the graft were integrating, um, showing good viability and compatibility of our bone graft with the host tissue, um, as well as extensive vascularization. Um, and the regenerated bone uh, was fully populated with lumens, which are markers of prevascularization. And then these lumens further were even lined with endothelial cells, which are another marker of mature vascularization. So that is the full presentation. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'd like to open up for questions. I kind of gave a high level overview of a lot of the, the process and I'd be happy to talk a little bit further about any of the parts of the process or any questions that anybody has now. Thanks, Brian. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A in the chat. Uh, and so I'll, I'll try to get through all those, um, being mindful of our time here. Um, so first one I'll, I'll, I'll get is, uh, is the decellularized scaffold Xenograft bone material that you're machining to a uh, specific patient shape. Yep, that's exactly right. Uh, so we'll use a, a xenograft um, and mill it in the custom anatomical shape based on that CT scan. Um, and so we can do that uh, on whatever shape we have uh, are needed based on the CT scan, based on these graph models. Um, but yeah, then we'll mill that shape and fully decellularize it uh, and sterilize it to prepare it for uh, seeding and graph maturation process. Uh, one question I want to follow up with that on actually is uh, the CT scan that's being done to start this planning process. Is that mm -hmm. uh, a new addition to the clinical workflow or is that something that is already happening anyway? 
That's very commonly done. Uh, there's plenty of custom surgical planning companies out there that will um, these, especially for this clinical trial with the OMF surgeons, uh, they'll use uh, custom surgical planning uh, to not only create models for the bone grafts, um, that's, that's partially new, new process, but they'll especially use this technology to create custom plates um, to, for reconstruction. And so whether they're using you know, our epibone bone grafts or cadaver bone or autographs, um, either way, they'll end up using these custom plates and cutting guides to make sure that they're getting the precision cuts and the surgery that they want based on the patient's anatomy. Uh, also related to that, another question in the, in the chat, um, is there a limit to the size of the graph that you can create currently? And if there is, what are some of the challenges that you encounter as you keep increasing those sizes? Great question. Uh, so there is a limit of based on from the xenograft tissue of how big we can make that graft. Um, 